We are so glad to see y'all here tonight uh, for an evening with Mike Stone. And uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Mike Stone, uh, <coughs> he uh, is from Blackshear, Georgia. Blackshear, Georgia. He's a pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church. He's been the pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church for roughly around 25 years. And in those 25 years, they've averaged 63 baptisms per year. And uh, they currently run uh, more than a thousand every Lord's Day. Uh, just and, and I told him that I had was going to kind of do a little introduction of some things that I heard about him, but I won't share everything that I've heard about him. <laughs> Pastor Mike was saved around eight years old, and he, this is the great thing about him. He became a Southern Baptist by conviction, and it's always good when we have a Southern Baptist who's convicted. Uh, while he was attending college at uh, Valdosta State, University, uh, that's in Georgia as well. He originally went to Emmanuel Baptist Church in 1996 as their minister of music, and uh, he accepted the pastorate from a, by a unanimous call in 2002, and he's been serving there ever since. Um, he served a lot of ways in his community. He's ministered as FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, chaplain to the Pierce County Bears football team. Did they, I didn't know they had football in Georgia. Yes, sir. <laughs> they do have football in Georgia. Okay. Well, um, that's one plus. Anyway, he's first and foremost leader of his local church. Uh, some of his credentials, he's been past president and uh, an executive committee chairman of the Georgia Baptist Mission Board. Uh, he appointed, he's appointed committees to study states' educational institutions and the long-range health of the cooperative program, which we as Southern Baptists tout so highly uh, in sending out missionaries and proclaiming the gospel. Uh, he's immediate past chairman of the Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee. He's a member of the Presidential Search Committee of 2018 through 19. Uh, he served on the Resolutions Committee for the Convention, the Credentials Committee, and he recently chaired the Executive Committees, uh, the Executive Committee for the ERLC, or the Ethics and Relig Religious Liberty Council Study Task Force. Uh, he's a member of the National Steering Council of the Conservative Baptist Network. Anyway, I know that, uh, that you're going to be blessed by what uh, he has to share with us this evening. And uh, so I ask you, let's, let's start with a word of prayer. Is that all right, Brother Mike? I didn't get to pray with you before, but we're going to pray for you now. How about that? Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you. We thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you just for this opportunity to get together, to get to know Brother Mike. Uh, Lord, in his vision, his passion, for the gospel, and uh, Lord, for the convention. And Lord, we pray that uh, we would be better Baptists, but Lord, first and foremost, we would be better Christians, that we would be people of the book, and that we boldly proclaim the gospel according to your word. Lord, I thank you for Brother Mike and his stance, and uh, Lord, I lift him up tonight, and I pray that you'd speak to him, that you'd speak through him. And Lord, that you would speak to our ears, and our hearts would receive it. Lord, once again, be with him as he speaks tonight. Let it be you, Lord, as you set him aside. Forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brother Mike. Well, thank you, Pastor, for the privilege of being in your pulpit tonight. And thanks to each of you, our brothers and sisters, who've turned aside to spend these few moments together. I want to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and be finding with me, please, the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to read and uh, discuss for just a few moments verses 16 and 17. I do desire to share some information about my upcoming nomination for the presidency of the Southern Baptist Convention. Maybe open up for some question and answer time at the end of it, but I am first and foremost the, a husband, a father, the pastor of a Southern Baptist church, and I want to be a preacher of the gospel of the precious Lord Jesus. So tonight I just want to preach for a few minutes and uh, talk about the sufficiency of Scripture. And I really want to address it in the context of some of the ideologies and philosophies that are beginning to infect and infiltrate our own Southern Baptist Convention. So I want to speak on the subject of the sufficiency of Scripture, and the title of my brief message tonight is The Bible, My Analytical Tool. The Bible, My Analytical Tool. If you're able and willing, I invite you to stand with me as we just show our public reverence for the reading of the Word of God. A very familiar set of verses, 2 Timothy 3, beginning the 16th verse. 
The Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for training or instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete. One translation says that he may, that he may be adequate, thoroughly equipped. The old King James says, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I pray God would add a blessing to the reading of his word as we take our seats for just a few moments tonight. As we think about the word of God being the only analytical tool that we need to utilize to analyze the problems in the heart of humankind, to analyze the problems in our churches, in our culture, and even the challenges within our own beloved Southern Baptist Convention, one might rightly ask, have we not as Southern Baptists already won the battle for the Bible? Well, aside from the fact that the battle for the Bible is as old as Genesis chapter 3 and will not be fully and finally put down until the victorious second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I would submit to you tonight that we have in so many ways won the battle for inspiration, inerrancy, and infallibility. But even in our own beloved denomination, we are losing the battle for its sufficiency and for its authority. Why should the Word of God be the only analytical tool that we use to measure our progress, our success, to evaluate our church ministry, our preaching ministry, our pastoral ministry, and our collective ministry as a convention of churches? Three simple things that I want to show you drawn right from these two verses. And, and Pastor, I confess to you tonight, I'm not going to share anything new. You preach these same truths. No doubt you have preached them better and more clearly than I have and that I will do tonight. I'm going to tie myself to my notes tonight, not because I need assistance from my notes, other than the fact I need to be tethered to my notes because I could speak on this subject for about two hours and we'd never get to supper tonight. So in order to restrain myself, I'm going to tie myself to my notes and share with you three very quick and simple reasons that we ought to use the Word of God as our one and only analytical tool. I need to say a word first of all about the reason for its accuracy. Why do we trust the Word of God is indeed inspired, infallible, and inerrant? You understand that a book is no more reliable than its author, a command no more authoritative than its author. The Bible attests for itself that it has God as its author. Notice again in the 16th verse, all Scripture is given by inspiration. It literally means that all Scripture has been breathed out by God. Our own Baptist faith and message, the official doctrinal statement of the Southern Baptist Convention says, and I quote, the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It, the Bible, has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. Why do we believe that the Bible is an accurate word from God? Well, first of all, just let me show you two things. First, there's the issue of providential inspiration, that the Bible has been breathed out and inspired by God. That's why our Bible uh, uh, a doctrinal statement says we believe the Bible has God for its author. That's why a synonym for the Bible is indeed the Word of God. You may say, I'm going to preach today from the Word of God. Stand for the reading of the Word of God. You may say, the Word of God says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, because the Bible is indeed the Word of God. It's not Mike's Word. It's not the church's Word. It's not the convention's Word. It's not mama's word or daddy's word or the culture's word. The Bible is the word of God. This is why the psalmist said, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How can a young man cleanse his way? By keeping it according to your word. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. Revive us, O Lord, according to your word. The unanimous cry of the Bible writers is that the Bible is indeed God's Word. Isaiah called it the Word of the Lord. Hezekiah called it the Law of the Lord. Paul called it the Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The writer of Hebrews called the Bible the Word of God, as did John the Revelator. And Simon Peter said, when you were saved, when you were redeemed, you were not born again with corruptible seed. You were not born again because you bowed a head, closed an eye, whispered a prayer, walked an aisle, filled out a card, and got wet in the waters of the Baptist Church baptistry. 
Simon Peter said, you were born again when some faithful Bible preacher took down the blessed book of God like a sower sowing seed and sowed into your life that which was the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Simon Peter said, you were born again not with corruptible seed but with incorruptible seed which is the living and enduring word of God. And here the Apostle Paul simply says that all Scripture is given by inspiration. That little word, all, A-double-L, speaks of what the Bible student would call the plenary inspiration of Scripture. That is, we don't just believe that parts of the Bible are the Word of God. We believe that all of the Bible is the Word of God. And that's why we should never do, as one prominent American preacher says, and unhitch ourselves from the pages of the Old Testament. The Bible is the Word of God from Genesis 1 verse 1 all the way to the final amen of Revelation chapter 22. And I want to ask you tonight, you can answer out loud if you want to, do you believe that all of the Bible is the Word of God? If so, it should trouble us when a very prominent female teacher in the Southern Baptist Convention who has recently announced her departure from the Southern Baptist Convention, I'm speaking specifically of Beth Moore, commented on Twitter in an ongoing debate about the role of men and women in the ministry, a debate known as complementarianism, arguing with a professor named Dr. Denny Burke. She wrote, and I quote, We, Southern Baptists, we have put limitations on women that exceeded what Christ demonstrated. We did it, that is, we limited women's roles, instead of wrestling with the tension between the Gospels and the Epistles, end quote. Now, brothers and sisters, I submit to you tonight without apology, there is no tension between the writings of the Apostle Paul and the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's absolute teetotaling harmony. Why? Because Paul did not give us his opinion in the pages of the Bible. Paul didn't give us his preferences in the pages of the Bible. Even when Paul said, I'm giving you my opinion, he gave us his thoughts under divine inspiration. It was indeed the Word of God. And the writings of Paul are just as God-inspired, just as divinely inspired as the written words of Christ himself. All Scripture is the product of providential inspiration. Secondly, I want to say a word about proper interpretation. Here the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration. That word Scripture speaks of something that has been written down. We do not believe, as some religious groups believe, that, that a book just suddenly appeared as if by magic. We do not believe that God sent down a a book from the portals of heaven. But God did something even more marvelous, merciful, and miraculous than that. God didn't send out a book. God breathed out a word. And he breathed that word out into the heart of men who wrote down his word. How did that revelation get from the heart of God into the hand of the men and women sitting in this building tonight? That answer is found in several passages, including in 2 Peter 1.21. There the Bible, speaking of itself, says, know this first of all. Now, in South Georgia, we'd say that like this. When Simon said, know this first of all, we'd say, if you don't get this right, you're going to miss the whole boatload. You've got to get this down plain, bold, and straight in your mind right off the bat. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made as an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Why was, must we have a proper interpretation of the Bible? It's because God, the Holy Spirit, chose very specific words and used this word instead of another word. And that word has a meaning. Now talk to me for just a minute tonight. Do you believe that every word of the Bible is inspired? And do you believe that every one of those words have a meaning? And that God intentionally chose that word because he wanted to use that meaning? Because of that, we believe that that meaning can be derived with sound hermeneutics led by the Holy Spirit. If that is the case, and I contend that it is, we should be troubled in the Southern Baptist Convention by the increasing thought that we cannot properly interpret the text of Scripture unless we have a demographically diverse set of commentators on the shelves of our library. Now let me be more specific. There are voices in SBC today who say that if you want to properly interpret the Bible, you've got to be sure that you have some 
Anglo, that is some white commentators who've written Bible commentaries on your shelf, and you must read behind those who are of Asian ethnicity and those who are of Hispanic ethnicity and those who are of African American ethnicity. I think that's all well and good if you have a diverse library. I have a diverse library myself. But the meaning of the sacred text is not derived one jot, tittle, or iota by the skin color or the personal experience of the person reading the text. The text means what the text means. Recently in a prominent Zoom conference call about racial or ethnic issues in the Southern Baptist Convention, one guest said, and I quote him, it will, he longed for the day, and I quote, that it will not be black faces with white voices or black faces with predominantly white theology, end quote. Brothers and sisters, the suggestion that there is a white theology and a black theology is just plain bad theology. The Word of God has a meaning, and that meaning can be derived by a systematic study of the text. One noted professor at Southwestern Seminary told his class, and I'm quoting him, If you don't know it yet, if all you have is males reading the Scriptures, you have a very, very misinterpreted Bible. I need sisters within the body of Christ who can help to read the Scripture in ways in which my maleness is preventing me from reading it. End quote. This is the idea that if all you have are men reading the Bible, they're going to get it wrong. They've got to have some women speaking into the Bible. He went on to say if all you have are white people reading the Bible, they're going to get it wrong. You need some people who are not white speaking into that interpretation process in ways that our whiteness is preventing us from reading the sacred text. He went on to talk about the limitations of being an American trying to interpret the Bible. The limitations of being a graduate of a certain institution trying to read the Bible. I'm not trying to be unkind tonight, Pastor, but if I thought being a graduate of a certain theological institution was going to cause me to read the Bible wrongly, I'd try to graduate from a different theological institution. I have a very serious question tonight for this esteemed congregation. If being a white American male presumes an error as I try to exegete or interpret the Word of God, and I therefore need to reach out to an olive-skinned Grecian sister in Christ, and she has a different interpretive view of the text, how would we know that it's my white American maleness causing me to misread the text and not her olive-skinned Grecian femininity causing her to misread the text? The only way we would be able to decide that, somebody's got to get down the blessed book of God Maybe some Bible helps, like a Strong's Concordance. Maybe like Vine's Expository Dictionary. And find out what does the Word of Scripture mean. And let's rightly interpret it, led by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. In Matthew twenty two twenty nine, Jesus told his critics, You do err not knowing the Scriptures. He did not say you do err being all Jewish males. He said, the problem is you don't understand the meaning of the text of Scripture. I want to say it plainly as I know how tonight. If our gender, ethnicity, or personal experiences cause us to see something different than what's in the text, those experiences should be rejected and not embraced. The modern theologian can call it standpoint hermeneutics, viewpoint epistemology, but reading the Bible through the lens of our own personal identity and personal experience is best described as error, and it ought to be more at home at a Benny Hinn crusade than on the campus of a Southern Baptist seminary. All Scripture is given by inspiration. I'm talking for just a moment about the reason for its accuracy. But I want to say a word secondly about the realm of its authority. All Scripture is given by inspiration. Now, as I look around tonight, most of you are old enough to remember when then-President Bill Clinton, one of your former governors in the great state of Arkansas, infamously stated that his guilt or innocence in the Monica Lewinsky situation hinged on what the meaning of is, is. And we rightly and understandably as a nation laughed at such an absurd level of defense. But for all of our laughter, that does not mean that the word is does not have a meaning. The word is does mean something. 
And we should note that Paul does not say all Scripture was or all Scripture will be. He says all Scripture is. Always in the present tense. The Bible was the Word of God, is the Word of God, always will be the Word of God, eternally and forever ising. Awkward grammar, but good theology. All Scripture is. Now, what is the realm of the authority of the Word of God? Well, let me say just two simple things. First of all, I want to say a word about every Scripture. Every single Scripture. All Scripture. Again, when Paul uses this word Scripture, he's talking about something that had been written down. That's what the word means. Not your dream, your vision, your revelation, or your word of knowledge. Sometimes down in South Georgia, I hear people tell me what God showed them during the night, and I think you must have ate too much pepperoni pizza before you went to bed because God has said no such thing. But all Scripture. Not your experience, your emotion, or your feeling, but all Scripture. Not the idea that you got from going to a convention meeting and watching a panel discussion. God help us with panel discussions. But what we need to base our beliefs on is all Scripture. That's why in the next chapter he said, preach the Word. It's the Scripture that is the authority for the child of God. Interviewing lost people and determining their feelings, opinions, and experiences, that's all well and good, but it doesn't have anything to do with the proclamation of biblical truth. There's a movement in the United States, and it is infecting and infiltrating our own Southern Baptist Convention. It is known as critical race theory and intersectionality that believes, among other things, that your authority to speak to a subject is derived from your own personal identity. I submit to you tonight that all the answers that we need are found within the pages of the Word of God. On the issue of racism and ethnic conflict, only the biblical doctrine of creation has an explanation that all of mankind is of the same race. When we talk about challenges between the races, plural, we are actually making an unbiblical accommodation to the language of the culture. You're already losing ground when you talk about problems between the races because if you understand your Bible, we are all born of Adam's race and we are at the very least distant cousins to every man, woman, boy, and girl that has ever walked the face of the earth. If you believe the biblical doctrine of creation, we all have a grandpa named Adam and a grandma named Eve. Only the biblical doctrine of creation teaches that we have all been created in the image of God. And brother pastor, if you have bought the lie that we need to have racial reconciliation as a platform to present the gospel, you have put the social cart before the gospel horse. Jesus did not say that he had come into the world to save society from its ills and from its problems. In fact, Jesus said of himself in Luke 19.10 that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. In Mark 10.45, he said that the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And when the crowd that welcomed him on that day of the triumphal entry thought that he had come to shake them free from the tyranny of the Caesar and to give them their best life now, they threw palm branches in his pathway. They shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, glory to the Son of David. But when they found out that that wasn't the kind of chains Jesus came to break, that's not the kind of liberty Jesus came to give, their shouts of hail him turned to shouts of nail him because Jesus knew that the heart of the problem was the problem of the heart. And it is only through the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ that the dividing wall of partition between Jew and Greek and male and female and slave and free can be broken down. The answer is in the proclamation of the gospel. Last year in the height of some of the race riots that we saw in the United States, one of our Southern Baptist seminaries put out a video and admonished us to not focus on what these riotous rebels were doing but that we should stop and listen and try to learn about why they were rioting. Now listen carefully. I don't mind listening to anyone. I think we can always listen and learn but I don't have to listen to anybody to know why rioters riot any more than I need to try to figure out why a dog barks, a cat meows, and a cow moves. It's in the nature 
You know why lost people act lost? They're lost. Because men love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. The problem is down on the inside. And some of the new ideologies that are infecting the Southern Baptist Convention teach that we have to earn the right or a privilege to speak to a certain subject based on our own personal identity or our experiences. But brothers and sisters, the Word of God teaches of itself that our authority to speak to any subject and every subject is based on what the modern hymn writer called truths unchanged from the dawn of time. The late Adrian Rogers used to say that he was not an apostle, but he could preach with the authority of an apostle when he preached what the apostles preached. That he was not a prophet, but he could preach with the power of a prophet when he preached what the prophets preached. Our authority does not come from our own personal lived experiences or lack thereof. Our authority is based on what Jude called the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Let me give you just a simple example. I've shared this several times here in the state of Arkansas. When I became the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church, my wife and I were still six months away from becoming parents. But in those six months that I was pastoring, we didn't have any children. I still preach what the Bible says about raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You say, how in the world could you preach on raising kids when you've never raised kids of your own? Because my authority to preach on raising children according to the Word of God is not based on some experience that I had at the house changing diapers and burping babies during the night. My authority is based on the revealed text of the Word of God. And I remember that Sunday, Brother Harold, admonishing my congregation, if anybody here thinks I don't have a right to be speaking on this subject, you've just revealed by your question you have a shaky foundation when it comes to belief in the authority and the sufficiency of the Word of God. The realm of its authority relates to every scripture. Secondly, it relates to every season. Once again, the Bible writer here says that all scripture is an unchanging and an unchangeable is. The psalmist said, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. You know why the liberal, the skeptic, the scoffer can't change the word of God? Well, for one reason, they can't get to it. God's word is already established and settled in the heavens. I'm showing you tonight that God's word has never changed and never will change because God has never changed. Now, if you don't stay abreast of some of the conversations and, and, and uh, topics going on in today's Southern Baptist Convention, you may not fully comprehend what I'm addressing tonight. But the Word of God never changes because God has never changed. God has never progressed. God has never evolved. God's never been enlightened. Beloved, God has never been woke on any issue because God has never fallen asleep. But the God of the modern day great awakening is markedly different. The God of the Bible used to think that homosexuality was an abomination. But apparently, he had just adapted to the bigoted culture of Abraham's day. Now, you have leaders in the Southern Baptist Convention suggesting that God whispers about homosexuality while shouting about other sins. I told my church, I tweeted at the time, that if Sodom and Gomorrah was God whispering about sexual sin, I hope he never yells at me. Some would suggest that God used to be in favor of male leadership in the home and in the church, but he started getting a bad rap on Twitter, perhaps, hashtag misogyny, and now he has adopted a soft complementarian view. By the way, you know what soft complementarianism is? It's called egalitarianism. Soft complementarian, a soft view on the roles of men and women in the body of Christ. Pastor, I would not accept a staff member as a candidate that told me he had a soft view on anything. Could you imagine you're interviewing a new student minister? He said, I want you to know I've got a soft view on the deity of Christ. I've got a soft view on the virgin birth. I've got a soft view on the blood atonement. I've got a soft view on the exclusivity of Christ. I want you to know I've got a soft view on the bodily resurrection of our Lord. I've got a soft view on the inspiration of Scripture. Hey, lean in close and listen to the Georgia preacher tonight. We shouldn't have a soft, wishy-washy, compromising view on anything that the Word of God speaks to clearly. And it's not hard to see where soft views on the Bible lead. They lead all the way back to a tree in the Garden of Eden and a sinister question, Indeed hath God said. The God of the Bible used to be opposed to hands that shed innocent blood. But nowadays, God understands the dilemma of American politics. 
and thinks it's fine for you to back a candidate who supports the killing of pre-born innocent children. The God of the Bible used to believe that wine is a marker and strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. But apparently God of the New Age was watching NASCAR one afternoon, saw a, maybe a Clydesdale commercial, thought the horses looked really neat, decided he needed to lighten up on a little bit, and he discovered Christian liberty at the bottom of a bottle of Jack Daniels. The God of the Great Awakening has lightened up. The God of the Bible used to believe that it was enough to send Jonah to Nineveh with a message of repentance, even though Jonah had hatred in his heart for them and they had hatred in their heart for him. The God of the Bible used to believe that the power of the gospel was the power of God unto salvation. But the God of the great awakening renders the gospel impotent unless you can get a pagan world to like us. If you're going to come into agreement with God about anything, you've got to get up under the book called the Bible. Because God is not going to budge your way, not one inch, not one scintilla, not one iota, just because of what's trending on Twitter. Because when the grass has withered and the flower thereof has faded away, the word of the Lord will still be standing forever and forever. The reason for its accuracy, the realm of its authority. Thirdly and finally, the results of its application. What can we trust will happen when we apply the truth and the principles of the Word of God. Here we see right in the text that this breathed out Word from God is profitable. That is beneficial. It'll do you some good. For what? For doctrine. That's not a dirty word. I've been accused of trying to indoctrinate my congregation. I plead guilty as charged. The the Word of God is profitable for teaching or for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be one translation says complete another says adequate that is you've got everything you need within the Bible to do and be what God has called you to do and to be two simple things as I close this part of our evening together the Bible first of all is enough for our messages pastor if you'll commit to preach verse by verse and Chapter by chapter through the Word of God, you'll never be at a want for something to preach. I recently finished preaching through my 34th book of the Bible. That, you can do that when you preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night over a course of many, many years. I did my best for several weeks to try to finish up the book of Nehemiah. But the more I tried to finish it, the more I'd go to the next verse. And I'd find not just another sub-point, not just another point. I'd find a whole other sermon in the inexhaustible well of wisdom that is the Word of God. Warren Wearsby commenting on this profitability said the Bible will teach you what's right, what's not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. You've got enough to preach the Word if you'll just stick to preaching the Word. Now when we talk about the sufficiency of the Scripture, we do not mean that there is not knowledge outside of the Bible. There there is knowledge outside the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach you that 2 plus 2 is 4. I have a 1949 8N Ford tractor, and last year when I had to do some engine work on it, I didn't find the answer to that in in Leviticus. I had to YouTube that. And I had to watch a girl fixing a Ford N tractor. But when I get up to preach on Sunday mornings, I'm not telling God's people how to fix tractors. I want to share something that's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And the Word of God is enough. I received some calls as a leader in the Southern Baptist Convention during the early days of the racial protests surrounding the the death of George Floyd. Preacher, what do you think I ought to do this Sunday in light of all that's going on in our country? You know what my answer is? You need to keep doing what you were doing before all these riots happen. You need to study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because you've got everything you need for the messages that God's people need to hear in the pages of the word of God. Last June when I addressed the issues of racism in our country and in our culture, someone suggested to me a question. Pastor, you're widely read. Could could you recommend a couple of books to help me understand the causes and the cure of racism? Could you recommend a couple 
of books. I think they were expecting me to send them some links to Amazon.com. But I said, yes, I can recommend a couple of great books, Genesis and Romans. Genesis is sufficient to tell you how we got in this mess. And the saving cross that is pictured and prophesied in its opening pages and fulfilled in the, in the, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and exegeted by Paul in the glorious epistle to the Romans, that's enough to tell you how to get out of the mess that we are in. You and I have enough in the pages of the Word of God. It is our only needed analytical tool. It's enough for our messages. Secondly and finally for this portion of our night, the Bible is enough for our maturity. Verse 17, that the man of God may be adequate and thoroughly or completely equipped for every good work. That is, if you're going to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord, you're going to find it in the pages of God's Word. Now, Pastor, of course, this does not mean we never turn to commentaries, lexicons, or other resources. That certainly does not mean that we don't go to YouTube or maybe Sermon Audio app and avail ourselves of the teaching ministry of faithful Bible preachers who preached on this text before us. I shared last night that when I go to... a uh, a uh, resource like Sermon Audio, and I listen to great preachers like Stephen Lawson or John MacArthur preach on that text. If what I'm planning on preaching doesn't sound anything like what they were preaching, I want to have enough humility to say I probably got it wrong because there's only one meaning to every text. So we certainly believe that it's okay to go to extra biblical resources, but they only give us any profit to the extent that they shine light on the sincere milk of the Word of God that we should use to grow thereby. I was recently preaching in my congregation about this newfound emphasis of being woke. And if you're not familiar with that phrase, what it means is that something somewhere somehow has awakened you to some issue in your life, some sin that you didn't even know existed, but you've been awakened to the fact that you're somehow guilty of it. Of course, you can't actually be forgiven of it, even if you repent, but that's an entirely different sermon. Here's the question, the series of questions I posed to the congregation at the Emmanuel Baptist Church, where some of our own young people were suddenly feeling that they were being awakened. They were becoming woke to the idea that they were guilty of systemic racism. Here's the questions that I posed to them. You've been in this church all your life. I've been there long enough that our middle school and high schoolers, I've been the only pastor they've ever had. I know what I've preached. I know what our student ministry has preached. I know what our children's ministry has preached. I know what our Sunday school ministry has preached. I know what our Awana ministry has preached. We've done entire weeks of children's camp around the biblical truth that we are all one race in the presence of God. We did an entire student camp on the problems that we face in our culture. We have preached sermons, we've done Sunday school lessons, we've had seminars, we've had conferences around these very subjects of ethnicity and race. You've been in church and Sunday school all your life. You've had a sincere commitment to a daily devotional life. You haven't missed a revival service in years. You listen to Christian music every day. Your closest friends are Bible believers who love you and love God enough to call you out, to rebuke you and correct you if they see some sin in your life. But you didn't know that you were a racist until you saw that movie that Hollywood put out. You didn't know that you were guilty of some sin until you saw a video on YouTube or sat under a lecture of that professor. Beloved, I just want to bear my heart tonight and tell you I'd be very, very cautious before I allowed a secular book written by somebody that wasn't even saved to, in a seminar, a lecture, or even a seminary class to wake me up supposedly to some sin of which I was guilty that the Word of God and the Spirit of God did not wake me up to. Everything we need to be adequate, complete, and thoroughly equipped for every good work is found in the pages of the Word of God. In my opinion, one of the greatest preachers of our day is Pastor H.B. Charles, Jr., pastor of the Shiloh Metropolitan Baptist Church just south of me in Jacksonville, Florida. I love to hear Brother H.B. Charles preach. He became the pastor of a church out in Los Angeles seceding his father when his father, H.B. Sr., 
died suddenly. H.B. was 17 years old. And after a search for a senior pastor, the congregation turned to the late preacher's boy, a high school student, 17 years old, at the time of his installation as pastor. In the providence of God, their family was very close friends with another legendary African-American pastor in Los Angeles, the late Dr. E.V. Hill. And oh, what a preacher E.V. Hill was. So if that name doesn't mean anything to you, E.V. Hill is to the African-American Baptist Church in America what Charles Stanley or Adrian Rogers or R.G. Lee would be to Southern Baptists. So here's a 17-year-old boy preacher about to fill the pulpit that his father vacated when he died. And who would come across town to preach the installation service than the great E.V. Hill? Dr. Hill took to the pulpit that night, and as he often did, he gave his title before he gave his text. And in his inimitable way, he began to pose a question that he said, I want to be honest, I've heard this question all over this side of Los Angeles. Pointing to the young H.B. Jr. on the front row, he said, you're asking all over town, what can that boy tell me? He's just a boy. What can that boy tell me? What can that boy tell me when my marriage is in trouble? He doesn't know himself, he's just a boy. What can that boy tell me when I'm having problems with my children? He doesn't know himself. He doesn't have any kids. He's not even married. He's just a boy. And over and over again, the great black preacher supposed the question filling the heart of the congregation. What can that 17-year-old boy tell me? And nearly an hour later and more than five scripture texts later, Dr. Hill proclaimed, and I quote, He can tell you whatever the Word of God tells him to tell you. And E.V. Hill writes in his wonderful little book called On Pastoring, H.B. writes, that that message was a landmark for my life and ministry. It forged in me a confidence in the sufficiency of Scripture. And brothers and sisters, I've come this way tonight in part to tell you we do in fact need a tool to analyze our preaching and our gospel ministry. But in the providence of God, we have such an analytical tool. It is none other and none else than the Word of God. I want to pray for us. Father, thank you for the time we've been able to spend just briefly in your Word tonight. And I pray that you would use it to set the tone for the questions that will be asked and the answers that will be given. And I pray that our conversation among this assembly tonight would be to the end that the lost would be saved, the backslidden would be revived, our churches would be strengthened, our convention would be profited, and ultimately that Jesus Christ would be preeminently glorified. We thank you for our time in your house and in your word. and We ask you to hear our prayer in the blessed name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.